glad about it. Amen. I want you to join me today in the word of God. Hallelujah. And for those of you who are online, amen, I want you to put in your prayer requests. Amen. We want to touch and agree and pray with you before service is over. We take those prayer requests and we put it on our prayer conference line. So I want you to know that prayers are not only going up today. Amen. But they're going up every day. Amen. They're going up especially on Tuesdays and Fridays. Amen. At a particular time. So there's no prayer too small, no prayer too great. Because God can do all things but fail. And we need to know that. We need to understand that. Amen. And what God is doing and what God is saying. Amen. I want you, if you would, amen, to, as we look at certain things this morning. Have you ever had this question? If you've been alive for a little bit, understand who Jesus is, understand who God is and the Holy Spirit. Sometimes in your life, this question will come up. Much is written, preached, counseled concerning the will of God. I've heard some interesting things. Explained sometimes by a simple phrase for a bizarre situation. It just must be the will of God. And I've seen some disastrous things. Failures in life and people involved trying to explain actions. And you'll hear things like, I thought it was the will of God. I preface this to say, I would rather you step out on what you believe God is asking than not to do anything at all. But there's some guidelines, there's some basis to what we can think about and You're always looking for sometimes, I wonder what God would direct me to do in this situation. I wonder what God would have me to do. Where should I go? What should I do? What should I do next for my life? Sounds familiar to anyone. Okay. And sometimes young people were, as we, as, as, as they would try to figure out life and they're trying to think about things like career they're trying to think about things uh potentially like education what do i do ministry marriage relationships what are those things all about and sometimes it can be too early to try to formulate those decisions because you really haven't come to the fullness of who you really are in the first place and there are those challenges and we find that there are certain things that we have to continue to do. And there's some guidelines that we can really, really understand. And the first place that I'll take you, not reading any particular portion of that chapter, is Acts chapter 9. And Paul he was on his way to Damascus. He was traveling to a town. And he was going to get letters from the legal authority to persecute the Christians. On his way to persecute God's people. Interesting enough, the story is recorded again, like I said, in that ninth chapter of the book of Acts. And Saul journeyed. And a bright light shone from heaven, struck him blind. When Saul found out it was Jesus calling his name from heaven, he asked, Lord, 
What would you have me to do? Hmm. At that point, he was given div divine direction. Jesus told him, Saul, I want you to continue to go to the city and take lodging in a particular street, in a particular house of a man named Judas. There, he told him, it shall be told to you what you must do. This man was killing Christians. This is not a part of my message, but I would be crazy not to stop here and say this man was killing Christians, persecuting Christians, crucifying, hanging, whipping Christians. And yet, God stops him and says, I have something for you to do. Now, if I was the CEO and I knew someone was trying to tear down my company, potentially they would not be the first candidate that I would go ask, would you come join my team? Okay? If I know that you are a bully and you don't like me, but yet all, and you do everything against me, and then all of a sudden I say to you, I want you to be on my team this round. No. It doesn't make sense, but God is not like us. He doesn't play favorites. There's no buddy system. There's no, there's no code. God blinds him and says, I want you to go to where, I want you to go to this particular place, to this man's house, and I want you to stay there, and someone is going to give you instructions when you get there. And Saul obeyed. He had those who were uh, within him to lead him by the hand or the place where God had spoke to him. He actually followed the direction. There he prayed and he was fasting, waiting for God to speak to him. After three days, God said to a saint named Ananias, told him where Saul was lodging and praying, and he told Ananias to go there and put his hands on Saul and pray that he might receive his sight and to receive the Holy Ghost. Now, in God's eyes, that is just normal. But for someone who does not know you to show up to a place that you didn't know you were going to and lay hands on you, you receive your sight again, and you receive the Holy Ghost, that's a pretty powerful thing to take in. At this point, you're taking in information like we would say you are drinking from a fire hose. It's, it's, just too, it's a lot at one time. But we see here that he finds himself, Ananias goes, and meanwhile, Saul was in prayer. God spoke to him in a vision to let him know that a man named Ananias was coming. So you're in a place you've never been before, in a man's house you never met. Someone is coming who you don't know, and while you're praying, Andrew, God says to you, the person's name is Ananias. Hello. Judas, I'm sorry, I don't know you, but God sent me here for a gentleman named Saul. God spoke to you too? He let me know a man was coming. And his name is Saul. He's here. Judas, did you say somebody named Ananias is here? Yes, yeah, Saul. Do you know him? 
No, I don't know him, but God told me he was coming. Okay, if we're watching this on TV, we're thinking everybody's crazy, right? Nobody's taking their medication. Everyone has lost it. But now look at this here. Meanwhile, as he's praying, it happened just that way. Ananias showed up, prayed for him. His eyes were open. He receives the Holy Ghost and he was baptized. Ananias prophesied to him that he had been chosen to bear the Lord's name to kings. To the Israelites, to the Gentiles. And in doing so, he would suffer great things for Jesus. Great things defined here is not good. Great things defined in this sentence is enormous, horrific scenarios. Painful things are going to happen to you for in Jesus' name's sake. The testimony of his conversion and calling into ministry is powerful, and Paul shared it with people several times throughout the book of Acts. If you take the time to read that book, he knew that he would, that he was in the will of God for his life, and it would always be in accordance with an overriding purpose of God. Here we find Paul in a scenario where he was going for letters to persecute the Christians, and now he's going not for letters of persecution, but to tell the world about Jesus. Have you ever been in the situation where before you accepted Jesus Christ in your life, you were a certain way and your friends knew you to be a certain way? And then all of a sudden, when you accepted Jesus Christ and people are trying to remind you who you used to be, and you're like, that's no longer me. I mean, it's me, but I no longer do those things. So he's going to these kings. He's going to these Israelites, these Jews, and crazy thing which was a very big controversial thing. Gentiles are people who were not Jews. They were looked down upon. You cannot speak to them. They were a lower class in the eyes of the Jews. They were a lower class in the eyes of the Romans. They were just anything, anyone that was non-Jewish, You, they were a Gentile, they were pagan people because they worshiped other gods. You do not speak to them. You uh, properly elevate your face 45 degrees and stick your nose in the air and walk by them and not say anything. And here he gets a a prophecy that he's going to them as well. Can't get into that now because that's a huge, huge topic. So when we look at this, have you ever been confused or disconnected because you did not know what the thought was for his plan for your life? You, things did not go as well as you anticipated. You probably thought that I must have missed God. In actuality, the will of God is sometimes it brings us into difficult situations. The will of God would cause us to do things or not to do things, even though we might want to do things. And there's a conflict and there's a struggle and it becomes difficult. And as one man said, that the will of God is not a soft bed or a juicy steak. At one point during the course of Paul's travels, a man named Agabus prophesied to him and said, listen, if you travel down this road, down into Jerusalem as you plan, you're going to encounter severe persecution. Prophesied that thing to him. What did Paul do? Paul went 
Anyway, understanding that the eternal purpose of God was the ultimate objective for his life. Later, as a prisoner in a terrible storm at sea, he was reminded of that purpose, even though he was captive and influenced by the decisions of others, God's purpose in his life could not be turned or twisted or taken away. And let me say at this point that I believe every person has a primary will that we all share as believers. And that one, one of those things are is that your growth of our knowledge of God and our eternal purpose is something that is ongoing. It's something that continues to happen day by day, more and more each month. You've got to learn more about God. It is, should be something that constantly you, 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 you look after, almost as if when we were in school, we studied and we did it so we could get good grades on the test and then come to find out some of that stuff we actually used in life. Cannot say all of it, but some of it we did. <laughs> Little side note, I kind of remember more about school after I got out of school than in school. How's that work out? I don't know. All right, so we see here that we're supposed to be continually growing. Continually growing. I don't care if it's a story. You're reading the stories just to get to know the characters of the Bible. And then it's about, oh, my goodness. Okay, so how would I explain salvation? What, 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 is, what, what, is, what, is, what is that? How do I, what, what are some of the things I should do and some of the things I shouldn't do? How do where do I find that? And you begin to grow and you begin to know more. And the more you know, the, the closer you get to God and the closer you begin to understand, oh, I can't go that way because of that. No, nope, I'll go this way. And you begin to find out some of the primary basic things of God's will. Everyone with me so far? Okay, so he continues on his way, understanding that his internal purpose. So any person, place, thing, or situation that helps us grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord becomes a part of the will of God for our lives. Anything that helps you grow. I'm not just talking about great mentors. They're great. People can tell you about the Bible, tell you how to apply the Bible to your life. Present day, phenomenal. But sometimes it's the bad things that happen into, in our lives that causes us to grow closer to God, too. Anybody since the pandemic started to pray more? Anyone, when you find yourself in trouble, you begin to remember that God exists. <laughs> If we tell them the truth in God's house, you know, sometimes we, we, we take our relationship for granted because when things are going well and he's leading us beside the still waters and, you know, Mr. Rogers' neighborhood is on and we're, we're feeling great and Sesame Street comes on and Diego is good and all those different things and everything begins, everything is perfect and we begin to forget to talk to Jesus. So then Jesus becomes like IT, tech support. We only call them when there's trouble. And you would not be in a relationship with someone who is like that to you. Think about it. Would you be in a relationship with someone, the only time they called you, the only time they came around is when they were in trouble. Relationship? No. Friend? Mm. And when I begin to think about things that way, ooh, I begin to question, am I in a relationship with God? 
If that's the way I treat him, am I real? Am I in a relationship? He's in a relationship with me, but am I in a relationship with him? As you begin to learn more about Christ, you begin to ask yourself those kinds of questions, and they're uncomfortable questions. Gets a little quiet, right? That awkward silence in the room, then you're like, okay, how about that weather? We want to change the topic, right? Pastor Larkins last week was talking about sin, and sometimes you just want to change the topic because it becomes uncomfortable. But those situations, things, people, places, things, when we realize it, if it brings you closer to God, then it was part of God's will for your life. Oh, it, 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 it's, God will do whatever it takes to get to you. Whatever it takes. And when God wants you, <laughs> nothing can stop it. He chose a man that was killing his people and said, you are mine. And I want some of you to know, and some people think that I've done too much wrong. I've done too much that God would even think about me. And I'm trying to tell you that God wants you. You are his creation. Each and every one of you, whether, you know, no matter how young, no matter how old you are, you, we all have this purpose. And God will use the things, people, places in our lives to bring us closer to him. Sometimes, right, the situations in our lives, some people are in our lives, some things are in our lives for a short time, for a season of time for a lifetime, but whatever it is, the problem is, is that sometimes we're not willing to let those things go at times. I remember Tyler Perry saying that sometimes people are like trees in your life. Some are leaves. They're there for a season and then they drop and they fall away. Some are like branches and they suck the nutrients. They're, they're there to get more. They're receiving more from you than you are from them. But if it wasn't for them, you wouldn't sometimes receive what you need because those leaves are the things that catch the water and bring it down into the branches and those roots. Some of the people are like the trunk and the roots and they're in your life forever. Powerful thing to think about, powerful analogy and you got to look at some times, and it's a great time in the beginning of the year to begin to evaluate. God, what is your will for the different things, people, careers, and stuff in my life? What we need is some basic understanding of what the Scripture says in the general will of God for all of us. So as we look we go to Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. And it begins to say, in the King James Version, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. English Standard Version says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, and acceptable to God. Which is your what? S reasonable service, your spiritual worship. One of the things that you're called to do. All of us. So that means, as the Bible says, lift your hands to the Lord. And he talks about singing praises to his names. 
talks about those different things. And so sometimes, have there been times that you didn't want to praise God? I, I won't talk for you. I'll talk about myself. There's been times where I didn't want to praise the Lord. There have been times where I didn't want to lift up my hands. There's been times I didn't want to use my gift in playing the drums or singing to give God praise and give him glory. There, were, there has been times. But even in those times when the Bible says there, you present your body as a living sacrifice. Sacrifice is a little bit different. Sacrifice is when you want to do something else, but you don't do it because another person told you not to. So you sacrifice your will to do that person's will. You remember growing up and your parents said, boy, you better not lie to me. Girl, you better not. Don't. And you want to lie so bad because it'd be so much easier to get out of the situation, right? And you sacrifice what you want to do to please that person. Present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. This is your spiritual worship. Okay? So we see here that this is something that is important for us to note, something important for us to see, and we need to continue to do that, do not be conformed to this world, as it says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Do not think like this world. That's hard. We grow up here. We live here. It's around us all the time. More so prior COVID than now. But it's on our TVs. It's on the internet. It's in our social apps. It's all over the place. It says, I don't want you to think like the world does. I don't want you to you know, allow greed to be your motivation. I don't want you to allow lust to be your motivation. I don't want you to allow yourself to get so prideful where your head can't even fit in the room. I don't want you to think that the only way that you can get up is by stepping on someone's neck. Sabotaging their, their, their career at work so that you can get their position. I don't want you to act like the world. I don't want you to think like the world. And the only way that changes is to be transformed. And the way we transform our mind is by reading his word. Hearing the word talked about, taught, preached, shared. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God by testing. So when I'm in a situation, because I, I'm beginning to know the word, I'm tested to know the will of God based on what I know. And what I know could possibly be what I picked up the phone and said, I'm not sure what I should do in this situation. What does the Bible say about this? Can you help me? Maybe as simple as typing in the question in Google and see what pops up. But even though the answer is accessible, the question is, do I want to know the answer? Can we, can we be real? Can I talk to you guys? <laughs> Do I really want to know the answer? What happened to the answer is something that I don't want. I don't like. Now I'm held accountable to it because I know the answer. That's a catch-22, right? That, you're, you're in trouble. So 
we note here that this is, I want you to see something, that this, this what we see is not just, uh, we see uh, he will uh, for our lives is good, it's acceptable, and it is perfect. What is good and acceptable and perfect? That's what God wants for us. By testing us that we may discern what the will of God is, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. He wants that for your life. He wants that for our lives. And so when we look at this, we go a little step further. Determining God's plan for our lives, we see it in four different areas. Salvation, dedicating ourselves to him, separation, and transformation. Salvation, amen, we can all give each other air high fives because we got the salvation thing down. We accepted Jesus into our lives. High five, everybody. One out of four. Dedication we must present, which means to give, to yield, to dedicate ourselves completely to God. Become fully his. Willing to do anything he asks us to do, go anywhere he wants to send us. And I'm here to tell you, and you can look across the aisle, look, at, look down your row, and just tell somebody it's a process. That right there is a process. All right? There's no pixie dust sprinkled over your head, and then everything just, you're just a robot for Jesus. No, it's a relinquishing of your will when they butt up against each other. So that dedication will help you align yourself in a place where you understand potentially a little bit more what God's will is for your life. Because believe it or not, the kind of trouble that you get into with Jesus is more peaceable because you know you're in the right place. Third thing, separation. We got we, we, we to gotta clean up our lives, right? We got we to gotta do take some of the things of the world and take it out of us in order to, I, I know, yeah, lying, stealing, all those different things, greed. We, we've got to remove that because let me tell you something. If God tells you to give someone that last $20 that was in your wallet, but you have a greed issue, you're not going to give it. But then in God's mind, because you are willing to give that 20, then all of a sudden God blesses you more than the 20 that you had. But you might stop God's plan blessing for you, for your life in that moment because you aren't willing and so God allows us, he wants us to separate. He says, I want you to follow what, I, follow what I'm asking you to do, because if you do that, you're going to align yourself up, not for instant or temporary gratification, but for eternal gratification. It says, where a man's treasure is, that's where his heart is. So my question to you is, is your heart more here about earth versus eternity with Jesus? Where are most of your treasures stored? Fourth, transformation, daily study of the scriptures. Having communion with God to renew our minds in the ways that it will cause us to mature, become more fruitful in the knowledge of him. Some of us, you know, as we, as we grew up, you know, we, we, you could be 10 years old and you might be reading your little brother or sister a book that before you were not able to read and you would love it when mom or dad would, would read that story to you. But now if they give you that same book, you'd be like, oh, brother, I know that book already. That's so simple. 
because you grew, you learned how to read better and you begin to read more things. And it changes who you are. So that transformation, that daily study is very important. So 1 Thessalonians 5.18, it says, give thanks in all circumstances. For this, oh, what? Self-explained right there. Don't need any teaching behind it. What does it say? For this is the will of God and Jesus Christ for you. What's the will of God for, for all of us? Blanket across, give thanks in all circumstances. All right. This one, I forget sometimes. I'll be honest. These are the kinds of things where you might want to take that live, love, laugh picture down or move it off to the side and put this scripture up so you could be it in the forefront of your mind. All, right, all things give. Oh. I don't want to give thanks right now. I do not feel like giving. Matter of fact, the things I want to say is completely opposite. Giving thanks to God and also, God, I thank you for allowing this to happen to me. Right? And really mean it, not be sarcastic. <laughs> you really got to mean that thing. And that takes growth. I'm still, everyone is still working on that one. If anyone says that they've mastered that, you lie. Because what you're saying, faith, your faith is never challenged. And that's not true. Everyone's faith is challenged because God is always trying to get us to trust him more. Trust him more. All right. This should be a nice fun one. First, uh, First Thessalonians 4, 3 through 7. As it reads there, we can see it. We see the passages of Scripture as the will of God that we honor, that we live our lives in sanctification, to set ourselves apart, to be different. As we talked about, we understand. I, I, I want you to read that one. First Thessalonians 4, 3 through 7. But then even in 9 and 10, We've got to understand that the will of God for us is also to love one another. So we set ourselves apart. We love one another. And in fact, our love for one another is to increase more and more towards each other. If I'm growing more hatred for you, then I'm doing the opposite of growing. Because my love for you as I'm growing in Christ is not based on your condition. It's not based on how you feel about me. Bible said, for God so loved the world. The ones who says there is no God. The ones who says, who is God? There's so many of them. The ones who, 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 Spit on the people who say they love God. God says, I love them all. This is how he taps Paul, Saul on the shoulder on the way to Damascus and says, I want you. So how, how did God respond? How did Jesus respond talks about loving those people who despitefully and he says I want you to treat others as if you, how you want to be treated regardless of how they're treating you. I want you to treat others the way you want to be treated not in retaliation of how they treated you but Treat them as you would want to be treated. So if the tides were turned, if they were, if they were coming after you verbally, physically, whatever the case may be, how would you want to be handled? 
How would you want to deal with this situation? Hey, you know what? Obviously, we're not going to get anywhere right now. Maybe we should step, take a step back and breathe for a second. Right? How would you handle, how would you want to be treated? I wouldn't want to be treated like this. Well, then how would you want to be treated? Treat them that way. The Bible says it's like a heap of coals on your enemy's head. Like, how are you responding like this? What is wrong with you? I am trying to fight. <laughs> you understand? This is completely different. I want to incite something out of you, but yet you respond, Jesus, and he mumbled not a word. And when he did open his mouth, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Who is he? Right? How do you respond like that? It's something that we grow into. So loving your brother, we urge you to do that the more and more. And then it says that you aspire to lead. I want you to look at this. First Thessalonians 4, 11 and 2. It says that you also aspire to lead a quiet life. What's that second part say? <laughs> to mind your own business. Let the church say amen. No, it's fine. <laughs> to work with your hands, right? That you may walk properly toward those who are outside, meaning that they're not a part of the Christian community. And that you may lack nothing. So be about your life with Christ. So that people on the outside who are not Christians yet, they look at your life and they're like, you know, she's different. Doesn't cause any trouble. She's not like those other Bible thumpers out there. You know how they act. She's, she's a little different. I see her praying out there in the yard sometimes, and I see, you know, I, I see different things that they're doing. Feeding the hungry, and they're doing those different things. I can respect that. Okay? We got to make sure, in New Living Translation, it says it like this. And you guys are going to have to catch the rest of Bible study. I'm not going to go into all this. The New Living Translation says it like this, and to aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. It's a process that we get to. And in some aspects of being in the overall will of God, it's at critical junctures of our lives. However, when our decisions could affect us, our families and the church for a long time, it is a good, it's good to gain some insight. And the funny thing that when we look at some of the stories, there's a story about a missionary family uh, who lived years ago in the Philippines. And they lived on one of the outlying islands. And in order for them to get supplies, they had to take a large boat out to a particular point in the water and then move into a smaller boat so that the bottom of the big, the larger boat wouldn't bottom out and, and bust up and break. So when they would leave that, they would then have to go around and on the island, visible in their approach to getting to home was a series of bright spotlights. And it was positioned to lead them 
through an extremely narrow channel of water. And when all the lights were lined up so that they almost looked singular, they knew that they were in a safe zone of the channel. And when they looked at that, the, when all the lights lined up, it appeared as one light, it would help them distinguish the lights. And when they saw them that the lights weren't aligned, they knew that there was turns in the channel. So the missionaries were able to sa safely travel through a very treacherous course. And sometimes this was at night. And they referred to it as lining up the lights to home. Lining up the lights to home. Sometimes we expect that Jesus will roll out the blueprint and all the details and plans for our lives will be all mapped out all there at one time. You are sadly mistaken. That is not how this rodeo is ridden. It's more like a scroll. <laughs> you just get a portion of the scroll. And by the time you live through that, you roll down this. Oh, that's why God went through that. Oh, that's why that happened. I didn't even know that you were there with me in that scenario. But now as I'm reading this, as I'm seeing who, more about who you are, I realize that even when I wasn't acknowledging you, you are acknowledging me. And it reads like a scroll. And it's so funny. Because God's plan for us we would walk away if we knew the plan. <laughs> Can I just be honest with you? You would walk away if you knew the whole plan. You'd be like, oh, no. <laughs> no. But he takes us through stages, challenging us little by little to get us to the next point. By the time we're at the next point, we're like, you know what? Okay, that was so bad. God, what's next? And that's why I say in the in, in in the in the in our religion, in our relationship with God, there's no elevator option. No follow the sign that says stairs. We all got to take the steps. There's no skipping floors. Because if you skip a floor, you won't be able to handle the floor above it. Everything about Christ is about preparation. And it's the little things as we go. And all he wants us to do is... To just, just get to the next step. Lining up the lights, and I will be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Lamp unto your feet so I can see where I need to go next, which in turn illuminates the path as I go. How many ever use the light on your phone? to see something. Anyone? That light only goes but so far. Okay? Let's be clear. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I want you to go outside when it's dark out, turn on your light, and see how far down the street you can see. There's a limit to the, how far the light reaches. But if I point the light, I can see where I'm going. Little by little, Right? Especially now, because you don't want to do that whole little tap dance thing on the ice, just in case you step on it. And sometimes, it's step by step that gets you to the destination. I 
Anybody ever used your GPS on your phone and it rerouted you a way that you knew wasn't the normal way you went? That, it's frustrating because you're like, no. Why, why would it send me that way? I'm, I'm going this way. It's going to redo the directions and go this way. And I use a particular one, and I there was a time recently, I'm like, that makes no sense. I'm talking to the GPS like it's a thing, like it's living. Why would you take me that? I'm not going that way. And guess what it was trying to elude me of? Traffic and an accident. But I couldn't see it. But the GPS knew it. And it tried to reroute me. But because I know everything, God is like, nope, I don't want you to do it like that no more. I'm trying to route you around stuff. I'm trying to get... If you could see the 30,000 foot view like I see it, you would know what's coming, but you can't. So I need you to appreciate your limitations and appreciate the fact that I don't have any and I'm trying to tell you. And all the time, Jesus is trying to line up the lights. To get you home safely. We're going to stop here. If you, re if you don't remember anything else, your relationship with the Lord is about how much can he get you to trust him. You start your relationship with a God that you cannot see. You didn't have the opportunity like the disciples did to walk with him for three and a half years. You didn't have the ability like Thomas, Thomas to touch the nail prints in his hand and put your hand in his side. It's really you. Jesus says, blessed are they that believe who would not see me. But yet they still believe anyway. We are a part of that group. So I got to trust God more than I trust myself. Whew. I know me. You know how long I knew me? You know how long you knew you? All those years we've been, we've been together, me, myself, and I, we've been together, we, were, we like this. <laughs> and God says, I created you. I knew you before you knew that there was a you. You can't even fathom how much he loves you. I can't fathom how much he loves me because my love has limits. My thoughts are limited compared to an all-knowing, created, cre the God who created all things. We don't even think the same. And the Bible just gives us a glimpse of where we're going. Not even a full picture. Why? Because we dropped the mic. No, I'm not going there. This is crazy. It would blow our mind. So this morning, I want you to act like there's no one else in the room. As you close your eyes or as you reflect, God 
God just wants to get closer to you. And he wants you to want to get closer to him. Now, as we stated, there will be some changes. But they're all for your good. Not the short game, the long game. And I need you to focus on the little steps that he gives us to get us to our destination. The question I want you to ask yourself is, am I ready? Am I ready? Because we all have those places in our lives where we have to ask ourselves, am I ready? Father, we thank you. We thank you for the ability to to know you. We thank you for the ability, Lord God, to understand you more and more each day. Father, I pray even now, Lord God, that you would continue to give us understanding, Father, of who you are. You are our compass. You are our direction, and we cannot do it without you. Lord, we thank you for all that you're doing in our lives. And Father, we pray even now if someone had accepted you, Father, as their Lord and Savior, because they realize that you did die on the cross for their sins and that you rose again on the third day, and you are the Son of God. Father, that they know that the gates are open and their name is written in that book of life as the angels stand up to give an ovation like we've never heard saying welcome to the family we thank you now in jesus name we pray amen and amen we're going to get god bless you thank you for tuning in today Pastor Arnold here, be sure to subscribe to our channel. Uh, that way you can stay connected with us and see all the new and upcoming things that we have from S Sunday sermons to Bible studies to special interviews. We are so excited that you are here with us. God bless you and know that we're praying for you.